This is this is Tom Duty, middle-aged American living in New Jersey near the Lincoln Tunnel. If you're to give visit my website, you would type Howdy Duty into Google. You'll find the correct spelling of the famous puppet. You then combine Tom Duty in a Google search for my site. This is Kiko's in New Jersey near the Lincoln Tunnel. I was at Kramer's last night. It's, it's obvious that this is K-I-K-O-S. But Kramer's blurred into the, the clarity of my screen. <laughs> Choosing the location of a liquor store on a Friday night is not a coincidence. There's a lot of activity here. I'll be reading from the New York Times six days ago earlier this week. This is not a piece that needs to be fresh. It is an opinion piece that would still seem fresh, you know, weeks from now. New York Times. Susan. Fails Hill. Susan Fails Hill. Title I named my mixed race daughter for a slave trading town. So this is Listeners, I just can't get started. I was the subject of a police call last night, and there, though it's not in view of the screen, it is a police car here. And it just pisses me off, but I draw attention to myself when I do this, and I really wish I could somehow just stand out in my neighborhood, read, and not bring attention to myself. However, I think that's exactly what I'm doing. So very soon, a police car will pass through right behind this white van. There's another car, and there's the police car. Probably going right on their way. I'm trying to look like a guy just talking on his phone. But unfortunately, that's not how the neighborhood always sees me. Now, I'm much closer to my apartment, my home tonight than I was last night. So theoretically, that's going to kind of make me a familiar face in the neighborhood. So it's the police past, I will continue. Testing. An oil paving of Susan Fay Fails Hill's great-great-grandfather hangs in her apartment in Manhattan. He turned out to be not as upstanding as she once thought. Hillary Swift for the New York Times. So I have a correction already. I, I'm confused. Hillary Swift seems to be the writer. Susan Hill is the woman who's being featured. For nearly 20 years, my great, great, great grandfather portrait was watched over me from a red dining room wall with his high color collar, ruffled cravat and black waistcoat Samuel Fales born 1775 died 1848 
It's the very image of an upstanding 19th century New England gentleman. An eminent merchant, an alderman of Boston. He was the founder of the family shipping business. I've known his face, taken comfort in his smile. Since I was a child attending Sunday lunch with my grandmother in the 1960s. Samuel Fales seemed utterly unperturbed by the changes the 20th century had wrought. Among them, his great-great-grandson, unorthodox choice of a bride, my mother, a black Haitian-American actress, and my brother and me, his mixed-race descendants. His portrait has stood as an emblem of our family's pride in its history. You have relatives on both sides of your family who fought in the American Revolution. My mother would frequently remind me to honor my forebears, my husband and I named our child Bristol. Rhode Island, where some of the Balesis first settled in the 17th century. A year ago, I learned through new historical research that Bristol had in fact served as a main hub transportation of Atlantic slave trade. This gave me great pause. I had done my dog daughter a dreadful disservice upon reflection i decided that naming a multicultural african-american slave port was in fact redemptive the ultimate act of reclamation it never occurred to me that my family might have participated in the port's inhumane commerce <sighs> Knowing of my interest in Bristol, a friend sent me invitation this past spring to a lecturer by Yale, at, a, at Yale by Sean M. Kelly, a st historian of the slave trade. Unable to attend, I emailed the professor asking him if a podcast might be available, proudly informing him my family's connection to the town. He wrote back, generously sharing his lecture notes. At the email's men, he stated, you may be disappointed or gratified to see that I don't mention any members of the Fales family. I did do a quick check in my notes and found reference to Fales, who was involved in slave trading. Prosecution from 1815. I read on with dawning honor. As he descended the case, of Fales versus Mayberry, a lawsuit waged in 1815 against the captain of a slave ship for recovery proceeds from the sale of 150 slaves in the West Indies and subsequent sale of the ship itself in St. Bartholomew. The judge in the case, Joseph Story, chastised the plaintiff, Fales, for horrific nature of the slave trade and its illegalities under federal law. <sighs> the fails in question was none other than my great, great, great grandfather, Samuel. He had first established his wealth through trading slaves. The email dealt
a death blow to the pride I had in always hailing from a family of industrious and I thought uniformly uprising Anglo-Saxons. It was devastating to realize that our fortune had begun in America's original sin. <sighs> Ashamed of my own naive naivety and ignorance, I turned to the Fales family of Bristol, Rhode Island, a comprehensive history of the family written by my grandfather in 1919 to see how such essential truths eluded me for so long. Everyone in the family had a copy of the book. The problem was, like the Bible, few of us had ever bothered to read it, cover to cover. In its pages, I found euphemistic references to the West Indian trade, ships captured by pirates off the coast of Africa. Given Rhode Island's extensive role in the slave trade, it dawned on me that Samuel probably wasn't the family's only participant. Journeyed back through the pages and the generations, Timothy Fales, a Harvard educated teacher whom my father was named, left his post as Bristol schoolmaster to enter in the West Indies trade. Read slave ships as a result of his ventures by 1720 he was able to purchase vast tracts of land. Yet another ancestor had decamped to Cuba for 20 years in the early 19th century. Given that the United States' biggest slave trading family was De Wolfs and of Bristol, held plantations on the island, it is safe to deduce that he wasn't running a cigar factory. My grandfather referenced our forefathers' shipping ventures, but beyond rum, never discussed the nature of their cargo. As many prestigious American universities does, he had imposed an embargo of silence over the particular details of our family's past to create a noble portrait. The sense of betrayal no doubt felt by some students at Yale who have to live with residential house named after prominent slavery Vice President John C. Calhoun, or by those at Georgetown who walked the grounds financed by the sale of hundreds of slaves. In the case, though, the crime stain name was my own. And unlike an administrator at Yale, Georgetown, or Harvard trying to make amends for misdeeds of predecessors to whom they had no connection, I personally owed my debt-free Ivy League education not only to my parents' hard work, but also to the blood money acquired through my ancestors. I have lived the paradox that through my brown skin has excluded me from so-called white privilege. All my life I have benefited from the plunder of privileged whites. From the time I read Thackeray's novel Vanity Fair as a teenager, I have been fascinated by the character of Rhoda Schwartz, the woolly haired mulatto from St. Kitts, a mixed race heiress to a lucrative plantation and real life figures like her own. Now I know why their stories are mine. 
And like them, I occupied an uneasy limbo between exploiter and exploited. I, an African-American woman, every bit as much a debtor to my race as a descendant of John Calhoun's, or indeed as Georgetown University itself, Now, as I contemplated my ancestor's portrait, I cannot forget the thousands of lives ruined for my family's gain. How does one begin to pay such a debt. My pride in my family's accomplishments has given way to somber resignation of the fact that I can never make full amends for their crimes. <sighs> the fact that I can never make full amends for their crime. No good deed or acts or generosity, past or present, will ever restore what my ancestors stole from thousands of families unknown to us and now dispersed across the Caribbean and the United States, two centuries of freedom and dignity. In the meantime, I can neither shun my great, great, great grandfather nor stand in judgment of him. <sighs> Some of his contemporaries, like Justice Joseph Story, who presided over the slave lawsuit, recognized that the evil of the slave trade. Had I been a white man in the 19th century, I would have been a forward-looking humanitarian, like the Justice. Was Samuel any more reprehensible than my black Haitian ancestors? who in often overlooked facets of colonial and plantation history belong to castes of blacks who own slaves themselves. The triangular trade bound Americas, South American Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean in a blood knot whose legacy we live to this day, but have never thoroughly explored our family's redemption and my own must begin with full and honest reckoning of our role in the world's alternating traffic several days after my exchange with professor kelly i shared what i learned with bristol now 13 over friday dinner with samuel fails portrait peering down at us <laughs> bristol's gaze at the portrait as i spoke and absorbed the relevation with her trademark equanimity but for the note of sorrow in her eyes i could tell she was mulling over the ugly facts a few weeks later i asked her how she was feeling about what I had told her. I'm not proud and I'm not ashamed, she answered evenly. She had accepted our slave trading forebears and yet another facet of the complex legacy she carries. After a slave port, I had no idea at the time. Couldn't you have found out? She challenged with a simple question. My child demolished all my excuses and reminded me of the truth of our family's history, like our country's, has always been hidden in plain sight. It's our duty to seek it out. Susan Fales Hill is a novelist, and she's the author of a memoir, Always Wear Joy. She's working on a history, on, on a history of two families, 
Follow the New York Times section of Facebook and Twitter, NYT Opinion. Sign up. Most popular on the New York Times.com. And that's the end. It blends right into some unrelated text. The Aroba, the Twitter IDs that it gives with this piece is Mark Mobility. That's Aroba Mark Mobility, or the at sign Mark Mobility. And Aroba Susan Fails Hill. She has a, a double last name with a hyphen and Twitter. It all blends together. She is Susan Fails Hill. And there's one other name. Hillary Swift for the New York Times. I really don't know who wrote this. It says by Susan Fails Hill. So one would think she read it. She wrote it. However, this other name, Hillary Swift for the New York Times, confuses me. Either way, it's a personal story of Susan Fails Hill, either written by her or by the New York Times media pro writer. This has been Tom Duty, middle-aged American living in New Jersey near the Lincoln Tunnel. If you were to visit my website, you would type Howdy Duty into Google. You'll find the correct spelling of the famous puppet. You then combine Tom Duty in a Google search for my site. Thank you for listening. Have a good day, good evening, a restful night's sleep. Ciao.